We've looked at some types of proof in the past. We're going to look at other types as well. Okay, this is the key thing. A proof, remember, was a valid argument, something, a logically valid argument. Now, it's going to be valid if it can take, and only if, by the way, if and only if, it takes a form that it's impossible for all the premises to be true and then the conclusion be false. Uh, if that situation is impossible, then we must have a proof. It must be a solid proof. Direct proof is the one you're used to working with, uh, known as modus ponens. Using our symbolic notation, that's pretty much the condition for a direct proof. What it's basically saying is, you have P, and you know P implies Q, then you can imply Q. So P implies Q is the condition, that means, well, if you know that condition and you've got P, therefore you must have Q. P would imply Q. Now to prove to you that this is always true regardless of the truth of P and Q, I'm going to put it into one of our truth tables. So let's put all the possibilities in. There's only four possibilities in this case. I'll transfer that through to all our P's and Q's. Remember, we work from the inside out. So P implies Q, and the only one that was false there was true implies false. Okay, so we've got true, false, true, true. Now we're looking at P and the blue one. They would become true, false, false, false. So finally, we get that green one we've just done and put it with the Q at the end. So true implies true, false implies false, false implies true, and false implies false. They were all true situations. So therefore, it, it doesn't matter the truth value of P and Q. This condition will always come up with a true result. So it's a solid proof. The other thing when we're doing the direct proof, if you know P implies Q, but you also know Q implies R, then it's fair enough to conclude that P implies R. Prove that if a number is odd, then its square is also odd. So I'm going to let N be an odd integer. So it's an odd number. In other words, it's going to equal to 2K plus 1, where K is some integer. I could have just as easily said 2K minus 1. I mean, it doesn't really matter. So if I square that... I end up with 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. But I can manipulate that. And you can see I've ended up with 2 outside of 2k squared plus 2k plus 1. But p, if I let it equal 2k squared plus 2k, must be an integer. Because when you square an integer, you get an integer. You multiply an integer by 2, you get an integer. You add two integers together, you get an integer. So that p is an integer. And that's the form of an odd number, 2 times an integer plus 1. So hence, if n is odd, n squared must also be odd. This one from last year's HSC was interesting. Prove that 2 to the power of n plus 3 to the power of n does not equal 5 to the power of n for all integers uh, greater than or equal to 2. I'm going to rewrite 5 to the power of n as 2 plus 3 all to the power of n. That gets all the numbers in that I want. Now, if you remember our binomial theorem, we could expand that out. We get nc0, 2 to the power of n, nc1, 2 to the power of n minus 1 times 3, and so on and so on and so on, all the way up to 3 to the power of n. But these are all positive numbers. So it must be bigger than 2 to the power of n plus 3 to the power of n. Because the first term is 2 to the power of n, the last term is 3 to the power of n, and you've got all these other ones in the middle. So it's got to be bigger. So that will be true for all values greater than or equal to 2, because uh, if n was equal to 1, you'd just get 2 plus 3, which is 5. They would be equal to each other. So that's, that would be true. So a quick little proof, that one. Prove that the sum of the squares of five consecutive integers is always divisible by 5. So five consecutive integers. This idea I'm going to use, it's a basic idea. Uh, but here's a formal way of saying it. If P and Q are both integers, and we know Q is divisible by P, then there must exist an integer such that Q is equal to P times N. Five consecutive integers. Now, I could have gone N, N plus 1, N plus 2, N plus 3, and N plus 4. But I've decided to actually make the middle one N and then have 
n minus 1, n minus 2, and n plus 1, n plus 2. I mean, there's still five consecutive integers, but the advantage of doing that, when we square that out, we're going to get a lot of cancelling. Because in our perfect squares, the first two will give us the minus 2ab, and the last two will give us a plus 2ab. And so they'll, they'll cancel. And so we'll end up with 5n squared. They're all going to produce an n squared. Uh, and then all of the last term squared, so 4, 1, 1, and 4, which gives me 5n squared plus 10, which I can factorise by 5. And uh, a p, well, yes, again, p would be an integer because n is an integer, square an integer, you get an integer. Add 2 to an integer, it's still going to be an integer. So it is some multiple of 5. So, yep, that one's true. So there are examples of direct proofs. We're pretty much using facts, coming up with a conclusion. Here's a new one we haven't seen. Proof by contraposition. In Latin, we call that modus tollens or tollens. And it uses that contrapositive idea. As I mentioned to you the other day, you see, sometimes it's easier to prove the contrapositive than it is the actual statement that they want. Prove that if 2 to the power of n minus 1 where n is a natural number, positive integer, is prime, then n is also prime. So I'm going to let n equal p times q. Because right? I want to, you know, we're saying n is prime. So I'm saying, okay, if it's prime, then it would have only a factor of itself and one. But I'm going to prove the contrapositive. So I'm basically saying it's not prime. So in that case, the two factors, p and q, neither of them will be 1. So it's not a prime number. So I'll now rewrite it. 2 to the power of n minus 1 will be 2 to the power of pq minus 1. Playing around with the index laws, I can say that's 2 to the power of p all to the power of q minus 1. And then I factorise. Remember the expansion of our... Uh, a to the power of n minus b to the power of n. The difference of two squares or cubes or whatever it happens to be. And the way we did it, the first factor was always a minus b. So in this case, 2 to the power of p minus 1. The second factor then would be um, 2 to the power of uh, 0, 2 to the power of p, p, 2 to the power of 2p, and so on and so on and so on. And the last one would be 2 to the power of q minus 1p. So that does equal p times q. I can factorise that. Now, p is going to be 2 to the power of p minus 1. Now, clearly, that can't equal 1. Because right? remember, we said p was not equal to 1. Or little p was not equal to 1. So 2 to the power of p must be bigger than 2. And if I'm subtracting 1, then I, I can't end up with 1. So I know p is not equal to 1. Now, q, well, q is 1 plus 2 to the power of p plus 2 to the power of 2p all the way up. Well, again, clearly that's not 1 because I'm adding all these things to 1. Got to be bigger than 1. So what have I just proven? If n is not prime, then 2 to the power of n minus 1 is not prime. Therefore, now I go to the contraposition. If 2 to the power of n minus 1 is prime, then n is prime. Usually a good idea to say by contraposition so you can explain why you've swapped that round. So you've said this, this is the method of proof I used. Contraposition. Proof by contradiction. And we have seen this before. Reductio ad impossible. <laughs> so it's, this is an indirect proof. And that's the logic behind it. Remember, when we do proof by contradiction, we assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove. So if we're trying to prove P implies Q, we will assume the negation of that. So the negation of P implies Q. If that leads to, now it doesn't matter, R is just some statement. But if we have both R and the negation of R, then we, we have our contradiction. So if by negating the P implies Q, we end up with these two statements, R and not R, we know we have our contradiction. So if we have that situation, then that implies that the assumption was wrong, so therefore P implies Q. That's the logic behind it. This one, I'll prove to you, is always true. I didn't bother with the second one because we'd already talked about that in the last one, but let's, let's prove that this one always ends up true. So there's our situation, so P and Q, 
the R and not R is always going to be false, of course, because you, you can't have them both being true or both being false. It doesn't work. All right, let's fill in. Uh, so that ends up true, false, true, true. The first one is the negation of that. So I get false, true, false, false. Now the next one I'm going to do is inside these parentheses. So false implies false, true implies false, false implies false, and false implies false. So we get true, false, true, true. Now I'm going with the green and the purple. True implies true, false implies false, true implies true, and true implies true. Well, they all would be true. So again, that structure is a solid argument. It's a logically valid argument. I'm going to prove that the log of 5 base 2 is indeed an irrational number. So I'll assume the opposite. I'm going to assume that it is rational. So in other words, I could write it as a fraction. I'm introducing another word here. I think in the past we just simply said where P and Q have no common factors. That would, the word for that is coprime. Coprime just means all of these numbers do not have a common factor. It doesn't have to be two numbers. I mean, in this situation, it's two numbers. But you can have you know, three numbers that are coprime if there is no common factor shared between the three. Uh, four, five, it doesn't matter how many numbers, but that's what coprime means. That's possibly a quicker way of writing that, you know, that there is no common factor in time. So P over Q, where P and Q are co-prime. Therefore, if I undo the log, 2 to the power of P on Q would equal 5, which means 2 to the power of P would equal 5 to the power of Q. But when I raise an even number to a power, I must get an even number. And when I raise an odd number to a power, I must get an odd number. So that doesn't make sense. The left-hand side is even and the right-hand side is odd. There's your contradiction. It can't be both odd and even. So therefore, the assumption must have been incorrect. So I take the negation of that. So log 5 base 2 must be an irrational number. Prove there are no integers a and b such that 18a plus 6b will equal 1. You can never find numbers that would solve that particular equation. I'm going to assume that you can do it. So I'm going to say there exists A and B, they're both integers. So there exists integers such that 18A plus 6B is equal to 1. Now if that's true, I can factorise the 6 out. So 3A plus B must equal 1 sixth. But what we know about 3A plus B it's got to be an integer. Because A is an integer, B is an integer, 3 times an integer is an integer, add another integer, so 3A plus B has to be an integer. But we're saying it's equal to 1 6. There's our contradiction. So 3A plus B can't equal 1 6, so I'm saying it's both equal to and can't be equal to. That's a contradiction. Therefore, the negation of what I assumed must be true. So there are no integers. A and B, such so that 18A plus 6B is equal to 1. Uh, 2020 HSC, so the first one of the new course. So in the set of integers, the proposition P is going to be, if K plus 1 is divisible by 3, then K cubed plus 1 is also divisible by 3. Prove that the proposition is true. Uh, let K plus 1 equal to 3 times some integer. That's what we're basically saying. It's divisible by 3. So P is an integer. Uh, for every single integer, this could happen. That's what we're saying. We know the factorization of K cubed plus 1. Okay. We know that factorization. So I can write it as 3P, because we said K plus 1 is 3P. K squared minus K plus 1. Well, K squared minus K plus 1 must be an integer, because we said K was an integer. So, yeah, it's equal to 3Q. So if k plus 1 is divisible by 3, then k cubed plus 1 is divisible by 3. Second part, write down the contrapositive of the proposition. So that's where we negate the converse. So therefore, it's, if k cubed plus 1 is not divisible by 3, then k plus 1 is not divisible by 3. That would be the contrapositive. Write down the converse of proposition P. So now it's the converse they want written down, not the contrapositive. And state with reasons whether the converse is true or false. 
So that would be the converse. Read it backwards. So if k cubed plus 1 is divisible by 3, then k plus 1 is divisible by 3. Now how you choose to prove it is up to you. They haven't specified a method. So you can use any technique you like. I went with the contrapositive idea because I thought, well, why did they ask me part two? Kind of makes sense. That's what they're thinking. But you didn't have to do it that way. In fact, some people might have even chosen induction. So I'm, remember, we're in the HSC. Now we're writing it down. So I'm going to write down that statement. There's the contrapositive idea. P implies Q is equivalent to not Q implies not P. That's what I'm going to use. So I'm going to let P be the statement k cubed plus 1 is divisible by 3. I'm going to let q be the statement, k plus 1 is divisible by 3. Okay, back to this again. k cubed plus 1, I know, is that factorization, which I could expand out. But now I'm playing around with the expansion in the right-hand side there. So k squared minus k plus 1, I've rewritten as k squared plus, two k plus 1 minus 3k. That gets a perfect square in there. So k plus 1 is not divisible by 3. We know that because I'm assuming the negation. k plus 1 is not divisible by 3. Now, if that's true, then look at the second one. 3k is divisible by 3. So that one is. But k plus 1 squared can't be divisible by 3 because k plus 1 is not divisible by 3. Therefore, that second factor cannot be divisible by 3. If k plus 1 is not divisible by 3, then k cubed plus 1 is not divisible by 3. So I've just proven the contrapositive. Therefore, if k cubed plus 1 is divisible by 3, then k plus 1 is divisible by 3 by the method of contraposition. OK. So we'll have a few to go at. And as I say, we'll use tomorrow as well to give us some time to try and get our heads around this.